man, your blood pressure's low. Man, look at that heart rate. How do you stay so relaxed? I said, well, I'm doing martial arts a couple times a week. Hey, what's going on? You're listening to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 744 with my guest today, Captain Frank Bages. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host here for the show. I founded Whistlekick because I love martial arts and said, hey, let's make a show and let's make some things. What things? Well, go to whistlekick.com, see all the things. Some of them are things you can hold in your hand. Some of them are virtual things, digital things, things that frankly have a lot more value to plenty of people. But either way, if there's stuff that we have that you want, a lot of it's free. In fact, our best stuff is free. But we also offer other things that you might be interested in. And you can use the code PODCAST15 to save 15% on any of those things that cost money in the store at whistlekick.com. Martial Arts Radio has its own separate website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, because we name things simply over here. We bring you the show twice a week. And our goal of the show and really of Whistlekick overall is to connect, educate, and entertain. If you want to support the work that we do, if you are appreciative of being connected or educated or entertained or maybe all the above consider making a purchase sharing an episode leaving reviews or joining our patreon patreon.com slash whistlekick lots of good stuff over there find out what's going on behind the scenes get drafts of upcoming books or training programs uh, behind the scenes information on guests school owners mastermind live hangouts there's a ton of stuff frankly there's so much going on over there nobody can participate in all of it and that's our job that's our goal to overwhelm you with so much value that you are excited and recognize that you get far more than what you pay that's our whole business model and if you want the entire list including the multitude of free ways that you can support us in our mission get some additional value back Go to the family page. Whistlekick.com slash family is the spot for that. I've had the pleasure of knowing today's guest for a few years. We've had the opportunity to train together. I met him through Superfoot Wallace. And he's a great guy. He's become a good friend. And I really, really appreciated getting to know him better in this format. It's funny. I have my friends on and I learn stuff about them no matter how long I've known them. And that's one of my favorite parts of what we do. Here we go with my conversation. With Captain Frank. Frank, it's good to see you again. Jeremy, also good to see you. Yeah. Saw you April, end of March, at Terry's. Yes, I was. Yeah. yeah it was, it was very, a good uh, weekend. Very good. In fact, I, uh, I, I sat by Terry there. We went to uh, uh, the uh, one show. The, uh, what oh, was right. It? You guys were at the was, Super Show this weekend. We went Last to the weekend. Super Show this weekend, but we took a Vegas show. And we uh, Cirque du Soleil. Oh. We saw Cirque du Soleil. Which and they one? had the ladies wrapped around in a ribbon hanging from the ceiling doing their gymnastics, just I like Terry it. did at the uh, seminar. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. He did her. The, the stuff that people can do in silks blows my mind. I think I first saw it on a cruise ship. It was like the, the physics of this. And obviously the physics works, but it just seems... It seems fake. The the combination of their strength in those what are essentially long curtains, it just continues to blow my mind. Yeah, a lot of them, I guess, uh, from what I hear, were former gymnasts. And uh, so they started out, you know, four, five, six years old. They probably went to college route after the college, possibly Mm -hmm. Olympics, uh, whatever. And now they're running out their career because they changed – uh, they're by the time they're 26, 27 years old, they're ready to retire. Yeah, that's a from what brutal lifestyle told me out there, it's 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 a tough way to go. Yeah, so cool. Unlike martial arts, where you can continue to do it into a later stage of your life, you may not be able to kick as high, but you can still kick. And uh, you know, and and I think that that's you know that's likely to be a recurring theme in our conversation is this notion that martial arts is or at least can be for anyone at any stage in their life but it doesn't mean that it's always the same uh implementation what and how i train can be just as valid as what and how you train even though 
what and how we train might be completely different. And even within Superfoot stuff, we don't do it the same way. No, exactly. And I mean, you know, um, I mean, you're not going to kick, of course, you're not going to kick up to the ceiling like a 16, 17 year old girl or guy or whatever, straight up. But as, try. Uh, as Grandmaster Wallace said, hey, there's no target up there. Get that. <laughs> you know, keep the knee up and get, get the kick down, you know, right. out and back, out and back, out and back. But uh, no, it's like, you know, I, I guess if you're a younger person, yeah, you can train six, seven days a week, five days a week, no problem. As you age, of course, you have to give your body a little bit of recovery time to be effective so you don't, uh, you know, damage yourself. And your body can usually talk to you. And you know what I'm talking about. As you get older, uh, uh, your body gives you indications that, hey, it's time to take a day off. Absolutely. How often do you train? What's I train routine, uh, weights like? three days a week with weights. Mm -hmm. And then uh, with Taekwondo, I do, I work out with uh, Grandmaster Wallace every Wednesday night, mm -hmm. the Wallace Dojo, we call it Wallace Wednesday. Mm -hmm. And then I usually do a, a formal class uh, on Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and then sometimes Saturdays, oh. a group class in Taekwondo at my uh, uh, Dojang where we train. Nice. You're so, active. So, yeah. And if, if, if it gets to be where, hey, this knee's acting up a little bit or, I mean, because bursitis comes and go, inflammation mm -hmm. comes and goes, it comes and goes with the weather. And if I need to take a little day off, then I take a day off. But of course, I'll always continue doing my stretching, yeah. which is important. The the mindset that that it not only allows but encourages time off for recovery and recognition that you know continuing to push it isn't a good idea. Is that something you've always had, or did you have to learn that with age? I think you learn it with age because your body speaks to you and tells you that, hey, I've, I've got even when I when I when I picked up martial arts again, uh, uh, 28, 29 years ago, when I started back up again, you know, I was in my 40s and it wasn't, uh, you know, your body, even though you're in your 40s, uh, if you're stretching and you're working out and you're using it, uh, it's not as bad as if you're just sitting uh, uh, lethargically at home doing nothing. So, I mean, it's kind of uh, how would I say? Uh, it's kind of slowed up the aging process for me that I noticed some of my friends, it's hard for them to get up out of a chair, hard to do this, hard to do that, where I have a little bit more, uh, 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 it's, it's a little bit easier for me to uh, go in and out of a sports car. Uh, of course, in the morning, you're stiff, just like everybody else is stiff, you know, and you stretch in the morning uh, and, and so forth. Uh, stretch out your back, uh, do your toe touches and everything. But uh, I just feel that it's really... Uh, uh, allowed me to be a lot more productive uh, by continuing in the martial arts. And like I said, body, your body's not like it was 20 years ago, but uh, I think it, it stays, staves off the old age. It keeps it at bay uh, somewhat. Mm. Now you, you said 28, 29 years ago, you started again, you started yeah. back up, which mm -hmm. suggests that there was a, at least one stint before that. Yes. And we'll, uh, we'll let's go we'll go there in a moment. But I'm I'm most interested in why and the reason why people do things rather than the what. Why did you start back up? I started back up uh at the time I was going through a divorce. Mm -hmm. And I started talking to some of my friends and they said, Hey, uh just start doing some physical activity. And I go, okay. And so I thought, well martial arts again let me go let me go to the local uh martial arts places so i went to a couple different places not that i knew what to look for but i finally set, settled on one that fairly close to my house 10 15 minutes and they, they appeared to have a good program they go to a lot of tournaments they've got a lot of activities uh and i talked to some of the students and you know it's it's a good it's not a a belt factory by any means where you're going to go in there and you know they've got a lot of uh uh 10 year old second third degrees running around uh so it seemed like legit school so i started it and uh going through a divorce of course you know it's it's not the the best thing you can go through but you have to kind of muddle through it uh is it stressful absolutely it's stressful but i found out that by starting the martial arts again just starting up uh and uh going uh it gave me a mental break where when I'm sitting there punching the bags, kicking the bags, uh, doing uh, 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 floor drills and stuff, the last thing on my mind 
was a divorce attorney or my house payment or how am I going to pay for this? Or uh, it's it just like a cleansing for, for an hour each day that I went. Mm-hmm. And I used to try to go at least three, four days a week. In fact, I designed my flight schedule around it. I had enough seniority where I could bid trips that got off early enough in a day that I could make the uh, uh, sessions in the evenings or right. vice versa. They have day sessions also. Okay. So flight schedule. So this is where we should, I, I know you a, a bit, of course, and this is where we should let everyone know you were, because you are officially retired now, a commercial pilot? Officially retired. Yeah. The uh, government says uh, you have to retire at age 65 from the airline flying, i.e. the Delta, American, United, flying the big jets for what they call a part 121 air carrier. Uh, you can, uh, however, if you want to go back into private flying and fly the private jets around, i.e. rock groups, executives, uh, that type of thing. But when you, for the most part, uh, go accept employment with one of those companies, you're kind of at their whim for probably about 20 or more days a month mm. where it would be like, hey, I'm going to go up to, to, to Terry's up to this seminar uh, and I get in my car Friday. I start driving and the beeper goes off or not the beeper beepers years ago, but the phone rings and it's your boss and they want uh, to take some clients down to uh, Nassau, Bahamas or something. Mm. And you can't say no. So you can't say no because it's your job. Yeah. So, and I mean, you know, once you get 65, I'm 60, going to be 68 years old now. Uh, I've been retired almost three years. So uh, uh, I could go back into that work, but I have enough with my martial arts, which is my hobby. And uh, uh, I, I have a farm out here. I run part-time up in New Jersey. Do you miss flying? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It would be like, telling bill wallace you can't kick anymore mm. Terry Dow. <laughs> we, I, we, we both know what bill would say to that i know, I know <laughs> we, we're not going to repeat it but we know what like we, he would I say, say. <laughs> he, he wouldn't put up with that totally. but anyways it's like telling terry dow terry you're 65 years old right now you can't throw any more jabs no more kicks for you mm. you know uh, how how do you you know knowing knowing that i know these two men and and knowing how difficult it would be for them that must be really difficult for you and, and how do you manage that well it is it's weird we're talking and I, I i talked to you and andrew about it it's like when you get in a group of like-minded people uh such as aviators it's a real camaraderie mm-hmm. a real uh squadron if you will and you get to know these people over years uh you fly with them you are stuck in that little tin can for uh six seven hours at a time even longer, if you're going to like Mumbai or something for 14 hours, you're living in this little, uh, uh, you know, a pod with these people. You get very strong bonds. And, and after, you know, 30 years, a quarter of a decade or whatnot, uh, several decades uh, uh, involved with these people, you develop a, a, a real bond with them. And so all of a sudden at age 65, the government says you can't fly anymore. You can be president of the United States at 80 if you want. But uh uh, you can't fly anymore. So all of a sudden you don't pick up and put your uniform on anymore in the morning. You don't put your sparring gear on anymore. Mm-hmm. You don't go to the uh, dojang or dojo. You don't throw your stuff in the bag, throw your belt in there, throw your water and throw your gi in there. You don't do that anymore. And it affects a lot of people that, you know, uh, I've lost this, this uh, 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 emotional support uh, that you've had with these people. And now you don't have that anymore. I had the luxury of having a very strong martial arts uh, 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 camaraderie with everybody. And we have our our squadron, if you will, people all over the United States, people in L.A., Kenny, uh, you know, Herrera. Mm -hmm. You got uh, Kevin Hudson. You got people all over the place, uh, all over the country that you form a bond with after several years. And uh, that is my support group. Now, that's where I have my. uh, uh, squadron. Mm-hmm. So I kind of moved over from one from one group, even though we were aviators, we were flying. Now I moved over to a martial arts group. I get the same emotional support, friendship support, and I still I still keep in contact with a lot of my flying buddies. But we don't fly anymore. Yeah. Uh, but you know I can still 
uh, uh, hang with the martial arts guys, the Danny Drings and these kind of people. I mean, the you know, the, these are the top shelf people in the United States of martial arts. Yeah. And uh, uh, it's just amazing the talent that's out there. And uh, I get to hang with these guys. And this is my brotherhood, my squadron. I, I know that feeling, certainly. I get the sense that you were aware as as that age, as 65 was was coming up, you know, you knew you were going to have to step away. And you, I suspect, knew it was going to be difficult. That it wasn't, you, you weren't going to flip a switch and go, oh, I'm fine with this, you know. How did you prepare? No, you wake up in the morning. I mean, uh, for the first year, I'd wake up at three in the morning. That's when I used to wake up to go to do my flights. And it's like I, I'd get up and I'd start, hey, you're not working anymore. Mm. You know, uh, your uniform's in a closet. You're going to go put it on. Uh, nope, I'm done with that. So it, it is a, a shift. It's a shift. And, and you miss doing things. I mean, flying was a great lifestyle. I mean, I could sit there and uh, uh, plan my flights uh, around seminars. Uh, Superfoot Seminar in Houston, Saturday. Well, I'll bid my flight schedule because I was senior enough. I'll take the first flight down to Houston, hop in a cab, go to the seminar, <laughs> hang around with the guys at night. The next morning, fly back, fly the airplane back with passengers, you know, stuff like that. I miss the things that, you know, and I don't mean to bring up a uh, 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 Grandmaster Wallace all the time, but uh, he lived close to West Palm. He still does live close to West Palm Beach Airport. <clears throat> and I'd fly down there. I'd have an hour and a half on the ground. He'd meet me at the airport. We'd have donuts together mm. outside a baggage claim and meet, you know. Uh, so, I mean, I miss little things like that. I don't think anybody who has met Bill Wallace will, will fault you for bringing him up because we we all know how impactful he is, how meaningful he is to those who've had the opportunity to train with him. And then, you know, for folks like you and I who've gotten to know him a bit better, how did you meet him? I met him through uh, Anthony Albanese, one of our mm -hmm. uh, guys in the Brotherhood. Anthony was a local martial artist here. He's been in martial arts since the seventies. Uh, he's a grandmaster in uh, Kempo Karate, and he's in the Joe Lewis system, and of course he's in the Superfoot system. And uh, uh, I knew him from just a couple little seminars and uh, uh, things up here in the New Jersey area uh, 15 years ago or so. And then uh, he said, Hey, you got to go uh, to Superfoot seminar about uh, 10, 12 years ago. And uh, yeah, about 10, 12 years ago, uh, went to the Superfoot seminar. Wow. This is great stuff. This is nice. I like this sideways stuff. I'll have to incorporate this stuff. And then uh, 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 a year or two later, uh, Grandmaster Wallace came back up and did another seminar. And that's when I said, uh, Anthony, I got to start coming to more of these things. Mm -hmm. And he goes, Hey, funny you ask, we're going to be going down to, uh, uh, Tampa, uh, for one of the uh, conferences. Great. Sign me up. We'll go. So I started, uh, engaging at that time and then, uh, uh, started meeting all the, uh, different people that are associated with, uh, uh the group. Nice. And then, like I said, with, with, with Grandmaster Wallace, with Bill, uh, uh, I started seeing him here and there at the airports. And uh, uh, we started a, a friendship where I would fly out and, uh, uh, you know, help him with his flights, be his travel director, if you will, sometimes. And uh, we, we formed a, 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 a good friendship. Mm, he's a good man. So, so let's, let's rewind the tape now. Let's go back. Let's talk about your first stint as a okay. martial the, artist the how, first did, how did that happen and when and all that stuff well the first stint uh i was uh out of high school i started flying airplanes and uh went to university of wisconsin and uh, uh i was in gymnastics in high school uh so always used to stretching and so forth and in college you have to take uh several credits of physical activity uh gym if you will call it or whatever you want to call it I mean, they had hockey, bowling, everything else. And they had they had karate, Shotokan karate. I said, hey, this sounds pretty good. And at that time, uh, uh, Bruce Lee in the 70s, uh, 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 David Carradine in Kung Fu. Remember the oh, – yeah. you, 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 weren't, you weren't born. Ed, but they, no, but, they, but I, I don't remember, but I, I, know, I, know, I know of what you're speaking. 
the TV, you know, on, mm. Honorable Grasshopper. Uh, <laughs> so anyways, uh, <clears throat> that sparked my interest. So I started taking Shotokan Karate uh, twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays. And uh, it was great. And I did that for several years and uh, uh, got up to uh, just uh, below the brown belt. And then I started flying uh, at night for a living. And I, I couldn't do it anymore because with the school load and then flying at night, I was flying air freight. A company was starting up back then called Federal Express. Mm-hmm. And we, I started flying contract for them. Uh, we flew uh, 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 canceled checks, Wall Street journals. Uh, that's how Wall Street journals would get from Chicago or New York up to Manchester in the morning is those little airplanes at night. When you wake up at three in the morning, you hear, eh, what's a guy in a little prop airplane doing up at night? Well, that's what he was doing. Just flying newspaper. Right. So I did that. So I had to kind of uh, not abandon, but I had to uh, pare my schedule down and I, I couldn't to do the martial arts anymore. And then, of course, career, uh, marriage, kids and so forth, uh, start up and uh, you're, you're midway in your career at your 30s and 40s, building yourself up. And uh, uh, that's what I did. And then uh, uh, when uh, uh, the divorce, which you know, like I said, it happens, it happens Mm -hmm. and you just got to make the best of it. It just, things don't work out. Uh, and that's part of life and you deal with it as you have to deal with it. And, uh, uh, that's when I thought, Hey, I need to do something physical. I talked to some of my friends. They said, Hey, why don't you do martial arts again? This is great. Okay. Cause some of my pilot buddies were martial artists and, uh, sure enough, I mean, in the beginning it was all physical getting back in shape and so forth. But then once we started learning, uh, a kata or a young, uh, 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 and started the sparring. That was great because that was just like a a, a, a vacation, mm-hmm. a mental vacation where I didn't think of things, and it was such a stress reliever. Uh, <clears throat> as a professional pilot, you have to take a physical every six months, EKG, blood pressure, this that. It's it's fairly well uh, involved. It's it's to the FAA because when you fly, <clears throat> Jeremy, you have two licenses. You have your actual driver's pilot's license, then you have your medical license. And the thing is you can spend all your life. It's kind of parallels martial arts. Again, you can spend all your life, uh, procuring, uh, everything perfectly. And then you can have a heart problem or a stroke. And all of a sudden it's taken away from you. And the same thing with aviation. That's why we have, uh, 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 the, uh, 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 insurance, uh, mm-hmm. for you, know, the disability insurance, because you can spend all these years, four years of college, flight school, uh, all this apprenticeship. <clears throat> then you get to the airlines, the majors, where you're major league, and all of a sudden you have a little bit of a heart murmur while well, you're disqualified. Uh, and so uh, uh, you've got those physical exams every six months, which guys usually don't sleep the night before. And then it makes you nervous. And, mm. you know, because you're, uh, you know, guys start talking about in the 50s. My God, I only got 20 more flight physicals to do before I retire, you know. But the doctors were so surprised because I was going through divorce at the time. The aviation medical examiners, uh, man, your blood pressure is low. Man, look at that heart rate. How do you stay so relaxed? I said, well, I'm doing martial arts a couple of times a week. And it got to be like it was a haven where not that it was like a, uh, a drug or anything, but, you know, uh, the uh, endomorphins and all that stuff. Uh, it just uh, it, you look forward to it. I could hardly wait to get home and go to uh, uh, a, a, a martial arts class. Yeah. You know, I would sit there. I mean, I remember coming up from Santa Domingo, coming up from San Juan, Puerto Rico over the Atlantic. And <clears throat> I look and I go, geez, if I land at this time, I'm not going to make my class. Let's go to a different altitude. <laughs> hey, the winds. No, I'm serious. The winds are different. So I, not only am, am I saving the company money by by cutting down the flight time, but hey, if we go at this lower flight level, the winds aren't as bad. They're not. Out, they're coming out of the northwest in in, in the winter time. It's uh, you know you're flying in the middle of jet stream. Hey, if I go to lower altitude, I'm going to burn a little more gas, but I'm going to save a lot of time on the airframe and. I'll get back 18 minutes early. I'll miss rush hour traffic. I'll make my Taekwondo class tonight. So Perfect. so what I'm hearing is those times when I was on a plane and we landed early and there was no good explanation for why, because the pilot might have had something to do. 
That's possibly. <laughs> possible. Or, or, or the, the, the winds or weather conditions change. But sure. a lot of time, uh, Jeremy, that, you know, they, they can everything for you. The computers figure out what's the best flight level, what are the best winds. Uh, air traffic comes in into play, too. We're not going to drive through downtown uh, Manchester, Boston. We're going to go on the outskirts, and we're going to save about eight or nine minutes. Uh, so it's the same thing with flying. So once you get up there, uh, there again, it's like martial arts. Once you get on the mat sparring, you had a game plan, but now your opponent is different than what you thought, and you have to change your fight plan, if you will. Mm-hmm. So it's the same thing with flying. You take off with X amount of fuel. You know what's going on. You know what the weather's like. Uh, uh, what, what are the uh, threats, if you will? And you know, you're always mitigating threats when you fly. You're off course most of the time because you're always correcting, correcting, correcting. Winds are changing. Things are changing. So it's like sparring. You go in and you spar. Hey, this guy, uh, hey, looks like Terry Dow. He's got long legs and stuff. I better stay away from this guy. Mm. Or I better jam him, one of the two. <laughs> Had you always wanted to be a pilot? You kind of, it sounded like there was not only no time, but overlap between college and flying. Yeah, my uncle uh, was a pilot for American Airlines, and I saw the lifestyle that he had. He had a little extra time off than everybody and stuff. And I go, hey, this is kind of cool. Uh, this is kind of neat. Let me try this. And so I went and got my, you know, you solo. If you don't scare the hell out of yourself, then you get your private license. And at that point, after your private license, you can kind of know that, yeah, this would be kind of cool doing it for a job. Uh, and uh, uh, the only issue I had at that point in time is that, as you see, I wear glasses and my eyes aren't where getting in the military, uh, they want 20-20 vision. Right. Now it's changed. The airlines have changed now. But back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, you had to have 20-20 vision. Once you got hired, your eyes could stray as they will as you age. And it's no problem. You can wear glasses. So for me, a disadvantage for me was that you'll never make the airlines, Frank, because your eyes are 2100. You'll, they're corrected 2020. My eyes are corrected 2020, of course. I can see perfect. But, and my uncle told me, Frank, you're never going to make the big airlines because you're 2100. You'll have to fly the smaller jets or this or that. You'll have to do this. You, you'll never make it in, 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 in the, at the big airlines. Okay. So it was a disadvantage at the time. Sure. But the advantage was those people that had small business jets and stuff and that, that equipment said, hey, here's a, here's a young kid, a young man. He's got a four-year college degree. He's got a lot of flight time. And if we put a bunch of training money into him, I mean, I talked back in the 80s, you know, fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars worth of training. This kid isn't going to get the jet time and then go to the airlines. Right. See? So what happened to me is I got a lot of experience. I mean, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of experience as a young guy in his 20s. And then uh, the oil industry went downhill. I was flying for an oil company at that time, big oil company all over the world. We were flying and I got laid off. And just at that time, uh, some of the smaller airlines were starting up like People Express. That's where I went. I came up to uh, the New York area and the airlines at that time uh, rescinded the vision requirement. And so I was able to have a lot of experience for a 27 year old. And uh, I had the experience level of a 35, 36 year old. Wow. Was that difficult for your peers? Pardon? Was that difficult for your peers? Because, you know, there's another. No, no, no. It was that I had. I mean, at that time, at 27 years of age, I had a couple thousand hours of, uh, you know, jet time and all this Mm -hmm. stuff where. Right. But if if you had the equivalent amount of training and experience of, say, someone 10 years your senior and you step into that environment, were the folks who were older, did they did they resent you as this young kid that was theoretically? No, 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 no. It's all seniority. I, I didn't go right to captain. You still have okay. to go your first officer and and, okay. and so forth. So, uh, you know, it'd be like someone coming in, you know, hey, I'm a, a black belt in uh, Shotokan karate, and now I'm going to go try Taekwondo. Well, you're starting out at white belt in Taekwondo, but hey, I know a front kick. I know a side. I know this side. I I know how to do a punch. So it's going to be a lot easier for you. But you're still not going right to black belt there. You start out at the beginning. It's like now if they change the age and said, you can fly until you're 70. I want to go back to work. I start at the bottom. 
Oh, would you really? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Or if I go to work, if I go to work flying a corporate aviation, I'm flying a, a, a private jet, I would start out in the right seat uh, as, as the uh, first officer of co-pilot. Mm-hmm. So do you think but, you would uh, go back? What's that? Do you think you'd go back? Uh, no, not now. It's been, you uh, know, there was some it, hesitation there. Yeah, if, if they change the age, I think they'll change to 67. Okay. And that's what I'm at now going on, on 68. But uh, so anyways, it was a disadvantage for me at the time with my glasses and eyes, yeah. which boomeranged around. And it gave me a lot of fantastic training at the time. And then those restrictions were lifted and I was very well qualified. Mm-hmm. It's almost, I don't want to keep bringing up, like, it's like Grandmaster Wallace. He had a disadvantage. Right. He hurt his uh, a leg in doing judo. He hurt it and he had to adapt and he got his own style of flying or of, of, of flying, of uh, <laughs> fighting uh, martial arts, which propelled him to the top. Usually when we have people on the show and we talk about their martial arts training and the things they do outside of martial arts, we're talking about how martial arts gave them tools to draw from to do their other things. But given that when you step back into martial arts in your 40s, you had decades of flying, I kind of want to flip that around. Was there anything in your flight experience, your experience with how to learn new? I'm assuming I've heard that learning new planes, it's like its own thing, kind of like a mini martial arts style. So I'm, I'm, I'm guessing there's something that you drew from your flying that you applied to your martial arts. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's all uh, uh, a prepping. You have to prep no matter what you do. When you go do a test, when you do a class, you have to prep. You have to be well rested. You have to show up on time. You have to have the proper, you know, uh, uh, sparring gear if you're going to spar. And you have to, you know, so there's that preparation that uh, of flying. Everything's pre-fight or pre-flight. And now it's pre-fight. Uh, so you do have to have uh, uh some uh how do you say uh regularity and a system that you have when you start martial arts and you do it uh and it's like okay we're going to start out the beginning of a flight with this and then we got the middle of the flight up at cruise altitude and then we've got the uh uh, a, a termination where we come in for the approach and landing and then we got the post brief and uh uh, martial arts has been like that. I've incorporated the briefing uh, in uh, a lot of my workouts. And I, I know some of the people that, that I've, I've worked out with that said, hey, that's kind of cool how you did that. Okay, before a workout, let's brief what we want to do. We're going to work to sidekick. We're going to work this, whatever. And we're going to do this. And we're going to talk about it, the mechanics of it a little bit. And then we're going to go warm up and do our line drills and get calisthenics, get warmed up. And then we're going to take that, do some drills with it. And then once we learn the drills with it, then we're going to incorporate it in some controlled uh, sparring drills, if you will. And then incorporate it into the sparring. That's our flight plan that we're going to do for today. It's like a lesson plan. And uh, I've always kind of followed that. And then at the end, when you get done, we have a debrief. We don't sit in a debrief room uh, like the military does and so forth. But you can sit in the cockpit with the guy. Hey, what do we do wrong today? What do we do right today? What could we have done better today? Uh, Did we ever get outside the safety envelope? You always want to stay inside the safety envelope. Uh, And the same thing. Uh, I'll uh, at the seminars. Hey, hey, uh, is there anything I could do different? Am I telegraphing? Am I doing this? What could I have done different that would have maybe uh, allowed me to get more shots in with you? Was my jab? Am I am I stepping out or am I am I uh, a telegraphing my jab? My feet are my am I shifting my feet too much, indicating I'm going to kick? What did you see as my opponent? And I can tell you what I saw from you that your eyes start to get bigger when you. Just get before you're ready to kick, your eyes go wide open uh, and things like that. So the debrief after uh, a seminar or whatever, a, a session is very important as it is flying. So if you do a pre-brief, find out how you're going to do your lesson. What are we going to work on today? What's your objective? Go do those drills and so forth. Incorporate those drills in uh, sparring or whatever, and then have a thorough debrief on what we could do better, what uh, what objective did we not make with that technique that we could do better? Mm. 
the notion of, of pre and post training or pre and post competition, it's something that I think on an intellectual level, everyone understands the value, but so few people seem to do. No, I agree with you. I, I agree because uh, when I do that to people, oh, well, uh, I get you going. Well, you got a minute? Hey, just hang on for a minute. What can I do here? Especially when you're working with guys that are, uh, uh, I don't want to say better than you, but they are better than yeah. you. They've, they've, they've been around and there's a lot of talent out there. Not that they've been in the sport longer than you are or whatnot, but they just have the uh, ability and so forth. And uh, they have the personality for it. And, you know, you can talk to these guys and ask them. And it's just great. I mean, uh, that, that they're willing to help you out like this and you know, make you a better martial, martial artist. It was always one of my, I don't want to say favorite, but one of the elements of competition that once I learned as a kid, it was okay to do so. I would go to the people who refereed my form or, or, or saw me spar. And what advice do you have for them? And just because you ask for it doesn't mean you have to take it. Doesn't mean you have to implement it. But to source mm -hmm. that information, and if you've got three out of five saying, "I wanted to see this from you," okay, now it's something I've got to at least strongly consider. Absolutely. All, advi all advice is not created equal, but. I think a lot of people are afraid of hearing the advice because it means they have to do something different or they have to, you know, put in more time or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But I would imagine that, you know, cause I, I've, I've worked out with you. You're great. Yes. Thank you. Great. And, and then, um, n I never, I, I had no idea you started late in life, you know, prior to our, our preparation for, for doing this recording, I assumed you'd been training forever. And to, to hear that, gives me even more respect for you because yeah, well, it, you know, it's been it now like you know, 28 years i started my early 40s uh with it but uh uh you know like i said it's just i think it's uh i want to call it uh when we fly airplanes we have the uh and you're running the show you have the captain's mindset you mm -hmm. have to have the martial artist mindset which uh i think has to lend itself to where you know i'm here to learn i'm, I'm here to learn everything uh, like I said, you know, practice, practice never makes perfect, but makes permanence. And, you know, as, as Grandmaster Wallace says, but I mean, uh, and, and it, it has so many, uh, 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 parallels with what I've done in aviation and martial arts that, uh, I don't know, it's just, uh, it just kind of blends in with each other. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, you have the egos, uh, pilots, fighter pilots. I've taught many fighter pilots. I've taught many top guns. And they're drilled in their head. You will not lose. You are up there as a fighter pilot. You will not lose. And sometimes it's bad for them because they don't want to take a criticism. Well, no, you're, I know. You're talking about teaching the martial arts? No, I'm teaching about flying. Okay. Uh, I, I was an instructor also at. Okay, at, I didn't know that. In, in the airlines. I was the FA. I was an FA examiner. I could give all the federal licenses. I could give you pilot's license and so forth. And we would uh, 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 teach uh, you know, when you learn martial arts, there's certain things you go through. And um, as you all know, physical conditioning, learning kata. And then once you learn to punch and kick, now you can start sparring, control sparring and so forth. And the same thing with flying. You go to ground school, you learn the airplane. You already know how to fly when you uh, come to the airline. But each airplane is so different. It's so different. You can only fly one type of air airplane. That's all you can fly is a 737 or a 747, but you can't fly both uh, or triple seven or whatever. But so you go through a ground school of about a month of uh, computer based training. Then you go into the flight simulators for about three weeks, just flying, uh, takeoff, landing, going through all the emergencies. And after you get done with the simulator, then you go into what they call line flying. So if I have a student pilot uh, uh, with me, the first time he lands the airplane is with people on board. So you could be sitting there in the back, Jeremy, and his guys, this is his first time actually landing the airplane. <laughs> and I would never know. With myself, the instructor up there, right. you know. So uh, you have to go through all these different phases uh, uh, as you would in martial arts and come up. But so to, to get back to the fighter pilot deal, you've got a guy with that attitude where he's a fighter pilot and they they're great guys are great pilots. But like I said, they're used to flying, uh, flying around a little Porsche or a McLaren or a Lamborghini, which is their jet. It's very responsive. And now you're putting them in a Mack truck, mm -hmm. you know, a flying building with a couple hundred people in the back. And it's it's different for them. And because now you got a uh, there's a lag with that big airplane. 
You just don't point one direction and go. Uh, uh, plus, a lot of the fighter pilots, they only know how to land in a straight wind because when they're landing on the aircraft carrier, you land into the wind all the time. Well, they're landing in a straight wind. But if you're going up to Boston and you got a strong wind out of the west, you know, yeah, you can land to the west a little bit, but you always have a little bit of a crosswind. So they are learning all new things. And so their ego sometimes would get in the way because uh, they're strong egoed people as uh you know not that most martial artists are but you know we we we're, we're, we're a group of people you know yep i get it you understand what i'm saying <laughs> i do, that's I do. Is you, you, you can walk in and hey i know how to do this well wait a minute no no let's back off a little bit you know there, there are egos in in all professions like mm -hmm. that but i think that uh, the macho pilot with the scarf and the goggles and i'm going to go off and ro romantically fly in the dawn patrol and all this kind of stuff uh you have that with the martial artists also i think i, I want the fighter pilots to have a bit of an ego yes oh definitely definitely and yeah. you want a, 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 a mma fighter or someone else going on is going to have a part of an ego too they have to to survive in the case in, uh, in the ring if if you don't you're, you shouldn't be in there because you're really going to get hurt if you don't think that you can win shouldn't be in that fight you shouldn't be flying that exactly. plane and that's where the parallel between aviation and martial arts is mm -hmm. there again it's the ego which isn't a bad thing like you said we keep coming back to grandmaster wallace and, and you know i know we both know that's not a bad thing you had been doing some training and you had your prior experience training before you kind of really had two feet in with what he was teaching did you find you had to unlearn anything no uh, absolutely not i mean uh uh sidekick was still a sidekick except i was starting out sideways mm -hmm. and so it was being disguised it's like as you've seen in many of seminars uh grandmaster wallace would say to someone okay take your regular orthodox stance okay let me do a sidekick ah you had to move your body okay let's do oh you had to move your body. So I was able to incorporate that. Like, uh, you know, they say at all the seminars, this is my way of doing it. Mm -hmm. It's just one way of doing it. Everybody's built different. Take these pieces or a portion of it and blend it into your own style or make it your own recipe. I mean, I, you know, some people like a lot of pepper on their food. Some people don't like pepper. I like a lot of pepper. Well, uh, you know, everybody's different. And, you know, I'll use it in an orthodox stance. Uh, but I usually start out sideways. I'll switch to an orthodox stance, do some punching, some kicking, mainly like a front kick, axe kick, uh, crescent kicks, and then I'll revert back to sideways and get out. Start sideways, finish sideways. But in between, you know, uh, yeah, I'll get in a pocket, but, you know, uh, but like I said, uh, so I, I think it's really enhanced it in the way uh, it's presented to seminars that he that Mr. Grandmaster Wallace presents at the seminars is such that uh, this is my way. Mm -hmm. Take what you want from it, mold it and make it your way. What are you working on now with your training? You know, quite, quite often I talk to people, what's what's keeping you going? I think what's keeping you going is pretty obvious. You, you've spoken to that considerably. But I'm curious about, you know, you seem to have a bit of a, a technical mindset, which makes sense given the flying. So I can't imagine that you're not with this, you know, pre-training, post-training approach that you're not identifying things. I want to get better at this. I want to get better at that. What are those things? Uh, mainly uh, uh, a sparring, not telegraphing as much. And that's why these debriefs are so important to me. Uh, uh, we're very gifted, Jeremy, and the group that everybody hangs around with that we hang around with. Yeah, you've got you've got experts in all the different uh, uh, disciplines. I mean, I can go you can go with a, a, a Danny Dring, who's a, a fabulous on the ground. But, you know, he's also a Taekwondo guy. I mean, a very gifted Taekwondo guy at that. He can hurt you at any range. <laughs> oh, 
But anyways, I mean, and, you know, uh, uh, all the other people, uh, uh, the Terry Dows and so forth. Hey, look at my kick. What, what do I need to work on here a little bit? Well, if you do this a little bit, this is going to help you uh, pivot. Just a look, concentrate on your pivot just a little more. So working on that, the technical things and uh, the same thing. I mean, uh, uh, a lot of people play golf. I don't play golf. I punch. I, mm-hmm. I, I do this instead of playing golf. So instead of going to these different places, uh, you know, ask the experts, ask all these Kevin Hudson's in this this uh, library of people that we have, the experts. Take a look at my not golf swing, but take a look at my jab. What can I do to improve my jab? And uh, uh, the same thing at the seminars. You meet people. What can I do different here? Give me your take on it. Mm -hmm. Uh, And, you know, uh, working on that, trying to stretch. I'd like to get full splits i used to have full splits as a gymnast back in high school but uh i'd like to work on that so i'm trying to start stretching every night uh and and just being disciplined with it so progress is it is it coming yeah yeah it's working i'm doing you know like uh i I go do the uh uh uh, uh, wallace method uh stretching teaching the muscles to relax i've been also incorporating a little bit of uh uh, what do you call it? Uh, 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 relaxed stretching, dynamic stretching, and then contracting my muscles, trying to get them tired and contract them till they shake, get them as tired and then let them relax. So, uh, that's the thing. And it's not so much like, uh, uh, you know, not, not so much that I can do a kick straight up, but flexibility allow me to maybe increase my range a little bit and speed. Yep. yep. As I'm, we I'm age, like I said, I'm 68 years old. Not a lot of 68 years old are, are throwing gloves on and doing this stuff, uh, you know. But uh, you look at our group and, you know, you got a lot of guys in their 50s. And you look at you look at the Grandmaster Wallace. It's just like unbelievable. At, at what is he, 75 now? 77. 77? Yeah. Just a couple of years. 77 and I still don't want to get hit by anything he throws. No, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> still- and he doesn't throw it hard. He doesn't throw it hard. He just just touch Jeremy, yeah. just touch. And I mean, I've, I've done seminars like eight or nine in a row with him when he comes up here in January. And mm-hmm. it's like, can I use my other side? Why? And I looked, lifted my side. He goes, what happened there? I said, just your little tap because it's he's so quick. That can, just a poof. It's just, yeah. it's amazing. His speed just, it's like a towel snapping. Yeah. You know, one of the things we, we, we watch him and we say, you know, I, I, I don't see him stopping. And I, no, I, I hope I hope he doesn't. Uh, I'm guessing you are of a similar mindset. I'm a similar mindset. Yeah, like I said, I I still I still have both my natural hips. Mm. I still have both my natural knees. I'm not a bionic man yet. Uh, knees, like I said, depending on the weather and so forth, they'll they'll act up a little bit. I get a little bursitis in them. My shoulders are the big thing that that uh, hurt a little bit, but. Not that you work through the pain, but it's maybe it's a little bit discomfort. But the the funny thing about it is the more weights I lift. I was just going to say that the weight training helps. Not the heavier weights I lift, but the more weight training I do, the better it is. And the more weights I lift light during the week, the better off my shoulders and everything is. So I'm just trying to stave it off by that. And the hanging around with uh, the group that I do, we're all like mine and stuff like that. And uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, physical and it's a mental thing, too. It, it is mental. You have to have that that group of people, that emotional support group that you have, hmm. uh, I, I think. That camaraderie is very important. Great. Um, if people want to get a hold of you, is, is you do you do weddings in the barn. Is that public? Is that a public uh, thing that people can it, rent? It's it's been private. It's okay. been private to this point, but uh, we are now uh, petitioning to the township. And now that I'm retired, we formed an LLC, and we'll be starting to do uh, a fundraisers uh, for the military, as we've done in the past, oh, fundraisers, cool. and uh, we'll be able to do weddings for a business now. Up okay. to this point, it was just uh, close friends, like family, and that's basically it. When you know, this will come out before that happens. But when that happens, make sure you let me know what contact information we can put in the show notes. Sure. Because this will this will stay up indefinitely. So people can say, oh, I want to check out 
this facility because I've seen pictures, you know, to the audience. Yeah, it's it's, 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 a it's beautiful, beautiful facility. I mean, Western Jersey here is just gorgeous. That's why, like I said, that that allows me to stay here with the higher than tax normal taxes as you would have in Massachusetts or any of the East Coast cities. But you know, getting income from the farm really helps out. Yeah, you know, and we hold our martial arts camps here too. We hold martial arts camps here. We uh, have the different schools come out and they do uh, forms in the, uh, we call it forms in the field and so nice. forth. And uh, we even do testings in the barn. Cool. So it works out well. I don't think I've tested in a barn. I've DJed weddings in a barn. Yeah. I've thrown hay in a barn. I yeah. A barn. It's a clean <laughs> barn. It's a clean bar. But I, anyway, I'm sure it is. <laughs> it, it is nice. It was just like, especially during the COVID time, when you couldn't work out inside, that's when uh, we invited a lot of the schools. Yeah. I kept the grass cut short, and uh, we did classes out here on the farm, out in the open, out nice. in the complete open. Instead of going, you could go to a public park, but then you got to uh, 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 have a, uh, a reservation for the park. Yeah. There's yeah, a lot of distractions. All those regulations. Yeah. So you know what I'm talking. And here it's in the open. I just cut the grass short and then we could all do our forms. And you could tell, I tell you what, uh, Jeremy, when you do forms out in the grass, you can tell when everybody's pivoting because you got these little round marks all over your yard. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. So let, let's wind down here. What, what do you want to leave the audience with? You know, what, you know, you've got a tremendous amount of experience. What do you want them to take away from our conversation? I just think, I mean, I think the things were generations ago, maybe my parents, your parents, maybe not your parents, your parents probably my age, but uh, I mean, back in the 50s and the 1940s, that uh, people grew older a lot younger. We have a lot easier now physically and, and whatever. And, you know, so I think and I do believe a, a 50 year old several decades ago uh, was like a 30 year old. today. Let me, let me back that up. The 40s or the 60s are the new 40s. The 50s are the new 30s, I think. And I think that, you know, uh, and I know for a fact, if you don't use it, it tightens up, it rusts up, it gets tight, and it's difficult to, you know, get going again. So once you get to a certain age, even your 40s and 50s, I've gotten several of my friends in the martial arts at age 60, oh, cool. at age 60. And it's like, get out to Canada WD-40, we're going to spray you all <laughs> over, you know, like the Tin Man. But they do uh, a slow stretching, very light kata, light punches, light bag work. And after about two or three months, it's like, I didn't feel this good 10 years ago. This is great. And after about three or four months of consistently going, uh, hey, I haven't felt like this since my 40s, uh, aerobically, physically. Uh, and I think that's good. Uh, another thing is that sometimes as you get older, it's easier. Uh, let's see. Seven at night to sun setting. Let me just sit on the front porch, have a beer, relax, watch the world go by. No, I got martial arts tonight. And you drag yourself over there. And it's not, if, if you got to go to a gym and work out, you got to really push yourself. You've got to go and go from weight station to weight station to push yourself. But when you're in there with your fellow martial artists, as soon as you open that door and you bow in and you line up, you're in for your workout. And you're just taken along for the ride. You're on automatic pilot. You're going to do it no matter what. Whereas if you work out in any kind of other discipline, just going lifting weights or I'm going to go here, I think you're more apt to not do it or, you know, uh, maybe pass on it. Whereas when, when you're in a structured martial arts group, hey, I got to see my friends tonight. Yeah, we'll go out afterwards, have a beer, have, have a chicken wings or whatnot. But, you know, at least there's some structure there with it. If you would ask me before I recorded this episode, what do pilots and martial artists have in common. I wouldn't have had any ideas, but I think I've got an inkling now. And it's one of the things I really appreciate about what we do and how we do it. Our, our format allows people to show us how martial arts threads into their lives, no matter what they're doing, how they're doing, where they're doing it. And this is another example of that. Frank, thanks for coming on 
I hope I see you soon. I know I'll see you soon. Listeners, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Check out the show notes. If you're up for supporting us and all the work that we're doing to support you, maybe grab a book on Amazon or tell people about this episode. Join the Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. If you want me to come into your school, teach a seminar, I would love to do so. I have a lot of fun doing that. And frankly, what I hear from places that host me is that the students got a lot of value out of it. So I'm doing something right over there. Now, if you have suggestions for guests or topics or feedback on anything that we're doing, I do want to hear it. Jeremy at whistlekick.com. That's my personal email. I read it myself. (laughs) Our social media is at whistlekick. And that takes us to the end. Until next time. Train hard, smile, and have a great day.